next level in your spiritual walk with God. All very quiet. How many of you are ready for, to be to go with God in the next level in your spiritual walk? How many of you? Can I hear a loud amen? amen. All of you should be shouting amen. amen. All of us want to go to a, into the next level of his anointing. To the next level of what he wants to do in our life. Amen. We just don't want to remain the same. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, recently uh, many speakers have come to our church and they have uh, given a word for the church. They, uh, many of them recently, some from India and other places, they have come and said that God wants to do a new thing in this church. God wants to do a new thing in this church. And I believe that the, even the messages that we started off uh, for, from this year about his soon coming and, um, you know, and uh, setting, uh, setting us apart, God setting us apart for his purposes and uh, holy living and, uh, you know, and that we are set apart for the master's use. Um, these kind of messages all actually snowballed from the time that we started speaking about Jesus returning soon. And we know that he's returning soon. He's, in fact, he's very, very doorstep. Okay, and we are in the last days, as you know. And, and the, the one thing that God stressed and emphasized to us was the anointing, was the oil of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, when I spoke on the, uh, on, on the parable of the ten virgins, the five foolish ones and the five wise ones, Jesus was giving this parable to his disciples and to you and to me. And in this parable, he's talking about the extra oil that the five wise virgins took with them. You see, Jesus was comparing the kingdom of heaven, the entrance to the kingdom of heaven is like this ten virgins. Okay? That's why. That's why Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father. And what is the will of my father? The will of the father is to have a spirit-filled life. Without a spirit-filled life, you cannot get entrance into the kingdom of God. Unless a man be born of the spirit and of water, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the water baptism. Okay? So here, I want to emphasize again of what Jesus spoke. And even last week's message, Pastor gave a message on Samson. On Samson, who had a great anointing in his life. He's, he had a great anointing. Always the anointing is given to, to, to you and to me. To all believers, the anointing is given for a purpose, for God's purpose. It is not for you to, you know, to, to, to flourish in that or to, to, to you know, to, to have glory, to take glory. But it is always for God's purposes. That's why the anointing is inside you. Remember when I spoke to you on, we've been clay jars, jars of clay. And we are just jars of clay, just made of dust and just made of clay. But God has put his treasure inside us. I said this. And I remember saying the prices, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, the abilities, the talents, all are in this treasure. And we, will, and we can ask the question, why does he want to put it in a, in a clay jar? That we are clay jars. Okay? Why does he want to put it there? So that you may know that the power is not from you. The power is from God and God alone. And that is why he wants to use us through the power that is inside us, his power. And we give the glory back to him. Hallelujah. So I was talking about Samson. So Samson had this great anointing in his life. God, it was, it was for a purpose. What was the purpose? To defeat the Philistines, the enemy. Okay, so God gave him this strength, this anointing, fantastic anointing on his life. But he lost his anointing because it was contaminated by sexual immorality and other sins. So his vessel was contaminated. So when your vessel, the sacleja, is contaminated, what happens is that the anointing, you lose your anointing. That not, not, the anointing doesn't go away. The anointing is still there because the word of God says it abides with you forever. But the anointing will cease to function. Got it? So when he lost his anointing, what happened to him? He got easily defeated by the Philistines. They defeated him. And so because he lost his anointing, okay? So that, I'm coming to that. So when I, when I was preparing the message, God spoke very clearly to me. Go back, go back, go back. And remember, try to remember what you spoke on when, I, when you spoke the first time on the oil, the, ex, the oil that the five wise virgins carried. And God, Jesus wants to emphasize this morning on the oil. 
the oil of the Holy Spirit, which is the anointing, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is emphasizing how important it is for us to get entrance into the kingdom of heaven with his Holy Spirit, the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. I was just speaking to the um, to my discipleship class this morning, and I was telling them that, you know, God's presence and power is inside us. The age, the, the age now, the church age, is the age of the Holy Spirit. And I told them, Jesus is already with his Father in heaven, and his job is intercession. He's interceding for you and me, so that in case we fall, he can talk to his Father and intercede for us. That, uh, that she, she, she or me is already washed in the blood of Jesus. So, you know, just, um, uh, uh, God just be merciful to that person. Okay, now Jesus' job in heaven is intercession. So now who's with us here? The Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, I have to go so that the comforter may come. You don't have to worry, he told his disciples. His, disi his disciples, when Jesus was with them, they were very brave because Jesus is with them. When once Jesus left and went up to heaven, ascended to heaven, Jesus said, do not worry. I know Jesus told them, stay on in Jerusalem because when the Holy Spirit, you will, you will receive power. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses to, to Judea, to Jerusalem, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus told them, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to live in this world until I come back again. You need the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, what I want to say, say to you is that I believe with all my heart that God is preparing his church, not just HRC, the church all over the world. He is preparing for the next move of the Spirit, a greater anointing. Can I hear a loud amen? amen. Hallelujah. It is about to move, he is about to move the church to the next level of his anointing. Hallelujah. It's too long we are sitting, you know, calm and cool and, you know, we are so complacent. We just think that it is time you rose up and did the purposes of God with the anointing that he's given us. He's already given us the, his anointing, which is in each one of us. Okay, let me tell you, tell you about that first before we go to the levels of our anointing. Okay? So first we need to understand that when we receive Jesus as our personal savior, can I have one first John two, two, um, yeah, before that, <laughs> we are going to the next level. Hmm? That's why my, my, the title of my message is, uh, can I have the title first, please? Uh, yeah, that's it. Welcome to the next level. Uh, anointing for the next level. That's the title of my message because God is going to move his church to the next level of his anointing. It's too long we said complacent in our seats, okay? So the first slide that I want to talk to you about is 1 John 2, 27. It says, see what it says. It says that when you receive Jesus as your personal savior, I've said this last week also, the last time I was here, when you receive Jesus as your personal savior, he's your Lord and God, what happens is the spirit of God comes and resides in you. That means he is a resident. The Holy Spirit is a resident, okay? He resides in you. He guides you. He takes care of you. Now that anointing, when I say the Holy Spirit, it means the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That is the anointing. So the anointing is within you. You see that? You, but the anointing which you have received, I mean, abides in you. And you, and you need not any man teach you and all that, okay? But what I want to show you is that, and another, there's another scripture also in John 14, 16. It says that, the anointing when Jesus said, I, I have to go up so that the comforter will come, so that he will remain with you forever. Forever. Amen. So if you have the anointing, but, but, there's always a but. Now, Jesus, you see, when Jesus uh, rose again from the dead, rose when he resurrected, when he resurrected, the first thing he went and saw his disciples, he came to those and because his body is resurrected, right? He came to his disciples. And the first thing that he did was, he breathed into them. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Go back and read Acts. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Then you will ask me, then why must have second time again the baptized the Holy Spirit? Okay. This one is Jesus saying, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Okay? And he, uh, he was with them for 40 days. Then he told them, don't go anywhere. Remain in Jerusalem because you are going to receive power from on high. When Jesus blew into them, it was the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you must understand, Jesus, as, even as he left, told them, remain so that you'll be baptized 
with the Holy Spirit, full baptism of the Holy Spirit, for you to have boldness and power and, and equipped, so that you're equipped by my Spirit, God is saying, to do the purposes of God in this world. Got it? Okay? So, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, the full, is, is what happened when the 12 of them were gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem. As they were gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, you will receive power when this Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is the second time they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. With, uh, they were baptized after Jesus left. They were in the room after 10 days. That is the 50th day, the Pentecost day. On Pentecost day, the Holy Spirit came upon them in, in clothes of fire on, on them. And they started speaking. This is the initial evidence you know that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit when you start speaking in the heavenly language. When tongues, uh, when you say tongues, some denominational churches they'll say, Yeah, la, this one, this church, uh, all devil speaking. You're there. So you know, instead of saying tongues, you say it's a heavenly language that God has filled his people with so that they are empowered and equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So without his power, without the Spirit, you can do nothing. I'm telling you, you can do nothing. Without his Spirit, you can do nothing. Amen. So here, I want you to know that when you're born again, that means when you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit is a res the resident. Then when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the initial speaking of tongues, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you desire and ask for God, and he gives you another language, another tongue, and you're speaking. That is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're completely immersed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And um, now this, this, this is the baptism. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. So here, you must understand, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, from being a resident, he becomes president. Hallelujah. He controls your life. That's called a spirit-filled life. And that is what Jesus is speaking to us in the parable of the ten virgins. Unless you have the extra oil, that oil of the Holy Spirit, that, um, that, that, that anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, present in your life, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. So it's not easy. It's not easy to get into heaven. Huh? So here I want to tell you this. Each individual, every one of us have received Jesus as a personal Savior, I believe. Okay, so the, so the Holy Spirit is within you. He's a resident. Now when we are baptized, many of you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, but don't just be there. Okay? You baptize the Holy Spirit, that means you, He is now controlling your life. You are leading a Spirit-filled life. Okay? The Holy Spirit is controlling you. He becomes president. Okay. Now each one of us individual, uh, are responsible for keeping that anointing and also increasing the level of your anointing. Now you ask me about levels of anointing or so on. Yes, sir. There are levels of anointing. That's the, that's the levels you need. That's why I said we need to get into the next level. Some of you are already in the top level. Okay? So let me just go through very fast and then I'm going to pray. Um, Ezekiel chapter 47 you want to read further and go into, you know, really doing some commentary and, uh, and doing some uh, research and all that, you can go to Ezekiel chapter 47, which clearly says there's a five-fold level of anointing upon every spiritual believer. There's a five-fold level of anointing. I, I have to say this because some of us, uh, we don't know what level we are in. So I need to tell you this and then we'll go on from there. So the word of God says in John 7 and 38, Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. What is the rivers of living water talking about? Anybody? It's okay. For me, I, I don't mind feedback. Rivers of living water is nothing but the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you believe in me, out of your innermost parts of your being, out of the innermost parts of your being will flow rivers of living water. So actually, we are in the rivers of living water because the Holy Spirit is here with us. Okay? So now here, yeah, let's go from there. So the anointing is within you. Please try to understand what I'm trying to come to. The power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The power and presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is proportionate 
to the experience, to the deep experience you have with the Holy Spirit. That's why you see uh, many people uh, going in, in a greater level, anointing is in a greater level. People like uh, prophets and apostles and you, you, you can just go to the YouTube and see how anointed these people are. They are in a greater level of anointing. And you see what's done. People, blind people are getting healed. Sick people, uh, you know, of cancer, just walking out of their cr crutches, walking out of the wheelchair. How? They have a greater level of anointing. Come to it. How come they can have it? I don't have it. I tell you. Everything costs. And that is why some walk in a greater anointing than the others. So here, let us see. What level are you in? You can identify which level you are in. So here Ezekiel tells us there are five levels. The first level is the spectator level. That means you have the Holy Spirit within you because you receive Jesus as your personal savior. You have the Holy Spirit within you, but you want to see other people flowing with the anointing. You don't want to do anything about your anointing. That spectator level, you're just watching other people flowing with the anointing. That is spectator level. Second, ankle deep. So now we are in the rivers, living waters. We are in the rivers of living water that is in the Holy Spirit. Okay, we are there now. So now, from the spectator level, the next level is the ankle deep. Ankle deep, you're in water, so it's ankle deep. The anointing is only ankle deep. Here it's talking about what? Here it's talking about people who have a shallow experience with God. They know they receive Jesus as their personal savior. They think that baptism of the Holy Spirit is just one, one time thing, and then it's over, it's finished. Okay, so they don't actually desire for spiritual gifts or spiritual anointing. So that is the ankle deep. If you are that, we will have a, we will pray for you soon. Not not today, maybe some other time, but we will pray for you. Then from ankle deep, the waters of the Holy Spirit, ankle deep, now we come to knee deep. Okay, knee deep length. Your anointing is only knee deep. These people, this type of people, have a deep experience with God. They have, but at the same time, they cannot want to go deeper. They don't want to go deeper into the realm of the spiritual realm. They don't want to go deeper into that. Okay, so they only knee level. Okay, into that realm. Then we have the waist deep. Waist deep. Waist deep is this type of believer. is very active in the church. Very active in the things of God. But, but, why, they, why waist deep? Waist deep means they are not fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. This, these are the people that Jesus says, lukewarm Christians. Waste deep. Waste is still half, isn't it? You are half-hearted about doing things. Of, you are doing the things of God, but you are half-hearted. Okay? So that is called waste deep. Then the last one, fully immersed. Wow, I like that. Fully immersed of the Holy Spirit. That means you are filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. That is filled, fully immersed. Hallelujah. These are the ones who are continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just one time. The sometimes speak all the time. You think people, great people like Smith Wigglesworth and um, uh, Spurgeon and all these were people, Wesley and all these people. We think how their level of anointing is. We think it's so easy. Then hours they spend just praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, going and reading the Word of God. They pay a price for that anointing. Amen. So. I just want to tell you that these are the ones. Jesus, God wants each our church, every one of us to be fully immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's the level He wants us to be in. Every born again believer, every believer, listen to me. You should desire to flow in the level of this anointing, fully immersed anointing. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The word teaches us that we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one day thing. It's not a one hour thing. Continually, you're working as a doctor or as a lawyer or whatever, but you're in your spirit, you're still praying in the spirit. And when you pray in the spirit, who don't, doesn't understand you? The devil. That's the only language he cannot understand. So the more you pray in tongues, the more anointing, the more anointed you will be. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Thus ensuring a fresh outflow of the anointing. Okay, that's, now I'm just going to pray for the message now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. Wonderful Jesus. Let's just bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is the most important person on planet Earth. Father, because he is the one 
that the Father and Son sent to complete the work that God intended to be done on earth. Hallelujah. The work is not over yet, but the Holy Spirit is here to do the work that God intended. Hallelujah. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would invade the sanctuary, Lord. Invade with the Holy Spirit, Father God. Hallelujah. The presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding and revelation of the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at our text this morning. Isaiah 10, 27, please. Isaiah 10, 27. Can I, all of us read it together? It's a very important verse. And if I were you, I'll put it in my spirit and I will learn and, uh, and I will by heart this, this uh, verse. Let us read it together. And it shall... That his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Wow. What are they talking about here? Let me give you the background first. Here what's happening is Israel, the nation of Judah, which is in the southern part of the, the southern part of the kingdom of Israel, Judah is in a very difficult situation. Isaiah is a prophet, great prophet. Huh? And Isaiah is saying this. He's saying the that the Israelites are under the bondage of the Assyrian army, their enemy. The Assyrians are the enemy, enemy of Israelites. They have burdened them, made them like slaves. They burdened them with so much of work and other things, burdened them with despair. They have bur the, the Assyrians have, dis have uh, burdened uh, the, uh, the, the Israelites with despair, with desperation and defeat. So they are defeated people. But Isaiah is prophesied. He's saying this. But here the prophet says that, you know, he's saying, God has not forgotten his people. Uh, his promise is this. His promise is this, that he will bring great deliverance and a great breakthrough, a great answer to prayer. How will this be done? Isaiah gives the answer. And the anointing and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Did you see that? The yoke, the burden that is on these people will be destroyed because of the anointing. See how powerful it is. And God is speaking to us also. Whatever yoke that we have, whatever problem, that means to go from the problem that we have, a yoke is a problem or a burden or a bondage. All of us also have, many of us have, we all have one, some kind of problem. To go from the, from the problem to the solution, the solution is the anointing. It is, it will break the yoke. Actually, it doesn't say break the yoke, it will destroy the yoke. Because if you say break the yoke, anything that is broken, you can replace it, right? If a vase is broken, you can fix it. Okay? So, so here, very specifically, Isaiah is saying it will destroy. That means it's forever. That means that yoke is forever destroyed. It, is, it will not come back. It's eternal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Completely, totally annihilated. Okay? It's totally gone. That's the power of the anointing. Not just break the yoke, it destroys the yoke. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. So in order for us to go from the problem to the solution, it is the anointing of God. It is the, His Holy Spirit. It is his, the power and presence of His Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Can I have slide two please? Now you'll ask me, what is a yoke? I just told you it's a bondage or a burden. So what, what kind of yokes do we have to see here? In the natural, in the natural, yoke means a wooden frame you put on two animals to make them to work together. So it is on their shoulder and on their neck. You see what the burden it is. It is so painful for them, for the animals. I'm talking the natural one. Okay, that's the yoke that they are to use for the animals to plow the land. They put them together so they cannot move anywhere they want. They have to go together. So the yoke means a burden that is on our, on our neck or shoulder. Something for decades we are having. A problem that we are having for a long time is called a yoke. Okay? But I, I spoke to you just now. It's the, the natural one. Okay? So here, spiritually speaking, yoke is a bondage. Some bondage in your life. And that has to be destroyed only with the anointing. Hallelujah. So there are many yokes. 
There are physical yokes, huh? sickness, disease, infirmity, me mental yokes, depression, fear, anxiety, suicidal tendencies, financial yokes, debt, poverty, theft, family yokes, children on drugs, rebellious teenagers, marriage problems, all these are yokes, habit yokes, drugs, alcohol, all these are yokes, bondage, people are in bondage for decades, a relationship in decade, a marital problem, decades, 10 years, 20 years, still that there's problem, unforgiveness, there's so many things, okay, that causes us to have a yoke, okay, I want to tell you this morning that even if we, what we go from that yoke, to the solution, which is the anointing, you must understand the anointing is the one that destroys that yoke. Hallelujah! So we need to know three things about the anointing. You cannot just say anointing, anointing, power and presence of the Holy Spirit. You need to know how it originated. Can I have, um, yes, the next slide? Next slide, three? Yeah, okay, thank you. The, origin the origination of the anointing. How, where did the, where did the, where did the anointing come first from? You see, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, when God wanted to set apart a man or a woman for his purpose, for the purposes of God, or he wanted to, or he wanted to sanctify some things in the temple, like um, uh, you know, in the in the in the temple and in the ark and all these things, when God wanted to set it aside for his purposes, he anoints. He anoints that place or that person or the thing, okay? He anoints it with oil. You know, the oil is not simply any ordinary oil. The oil also, God has chosen what, from where, and how to make it. I'm talking about the Old Testament, huh? So the oil is made of all the precious, you can go back and read, precious spices God has chosen, okay? And this oil is the anointing oil that they place when you're going to, they're going to, Anoint, okay, God is telling, set this person aside for me, this priest. Uh, that was how David was anointed, okay? He was anointed when they took the oil and poured on David. Samuel the prophet poured the oil and anointed him with oil to, for him to be the next king of Israel, okay? So in the Old Testament, you see, in the Old Testament, the oil was poured on the saying that this person is set apart for God's purposes. Okay, you understand? So, so also things in the in the sanctuary, things in the in, in, in the temple also can be anointed. So this is a special oil and all that. Okay. Now, now here, the Holy in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is the symbol. The oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So when God anoints that His Spirit is on them. He use oil, they use oil, olive oil, uh, different, and, and that is the symbol of the Holy Spirit coming upon the person. And God has set that person aside for His purposes. You got it? Okay. This shows that when God anoints that person, God's favor, God's approval, and God's presence is with that person. Hallelujah! And He is anointed for a particular office or assignment given by God. Okay, so the high priest was anointed with oil and all these things. Uh, furnishings in the tabernacle were anointed. This is how they did it in the Old Testament. The oil signifies the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, huh? so here what we see in the New Testament. Okay, in the New Testament, what happens is the anointing, I told you already, I, spoke, I, read, I read for you the scripture was, the anointing is within us. The anointing is with us. No need to put, uh, it's not in a liquid form that we need to be anointed. When we receive Jesus as his personal savior, he anoints us with his spirit. His spirit is inside us, okay? It's given to every believer. Okay, very good. Now you understand, it also means to be set apart. That means when, when you receive Jesus as your personal savior, and God's anointing has come upon you, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that means, listen, that means you're set apart to do the purposes of God. You're set apart already. Hallelujah. You understand? You do to do the um, uh, to, for you to empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit. That's why He has chosen you. When you said yes to Jesus and He gave you the Holy Spirit, that is to do His work. You're set apart. Hallelujah. So let me give you the definition of anointing. It is nothing but the supernatural ability to do supernatural things through the power of the Holy Spirit. I repeat, 
So don't think it is, oh, because I'm so anointed, I can do this, I can do that. It is, it belongs to who? It belongs to God. I told you in the clay jar when I was speaking. So the priceless anointing, the super, it, it is for you, it's a supernatural ability. Supernatural means only God can do that, only God's ability. Supernatural ability to do supernatural things. And people walk, when you, when, you, when you pray for people, you know, and like them and pray for them, and they, they are on a wheelchair and they get up and they start walking. It's nothing to do with you. You are a vessel only. So it is a supernatural ability doing supernatural things. Supernatural means God's things. Only God can raise that person up from the wheelchair. But we are just the vessels to be used. So nothing great about the person. Don't worship the person. Oh, because he's a, he laid his hands on me and prophesied this and that. Don't ever put any man on the pedestal. High and glorify him high and mighty. No, no, no. It belongs to God. The power belongs to God. Never forget that. Okay? So it is just the power <coughs> that's anointing. Okay? And I, I want to tell you one thing. When we pray for the sick or anything for with the petrol oil, okay? It is God who anoints the person. Whether it is a sick person or whether the person came for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you're praying for them, it is God who anoints that person. It is God who gives healing anointing to that person. It is God who gives uh, 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 peace in the family, anointing of peace in the family. It is God. Hallelujah. Now, what the anointing does, let me tell you one thing. You may be telling this anointing, do you know that this anointing, Jesus himself needed that anointing? Even though he was 100% God and 100% man, during his baptism, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, what happened? When he was baptized by John the Baptist, the heavens opened and, uh, and, the, and, 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 uh, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, dove, came upon Jesus. Where's the picture? Number two. You see that, that the, the anointing of Jesus? And the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in the form of a dove. Okay, and a loud voice was heard from the heavens. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus walked in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, how much more you and I need? Hallelujah. He was anointed and when he was, uh, the word of God says, after he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, Jesus then only began his ministry. Then only he began to uh, do the good works, uh, healing the sick and raising the, uh, the uh, and, and, and healing the raising the dead and all these miracles Jesus did after he was anointed. Amen. So uh, what I want you to know is when Jesus in the New Testament, Jesus spoke after he was anointed, he came back to his homeland. He came back to Nazareth and he was preaching on a Sunday, on a Sabbath day. He took the sermon, he took the book of Isaiah, and the first thing Jesus said was this. Listen, Luke 4, 17 to 19. Jesus takes the scroll, he's preaching on, uh, in Nazareth, okay? He takes the scroll and he says, the spirit of the Lord, you see, first thing he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Look at that, Jesus himself is saying, he has anointed me to preach good news, this is what the anointing is for. To preach good news to the poor. To release the captives from their bondage. Hallelujah. The, and the blind to see. The oppressed to be set free. This is what Jesus said in when he read from Isaiah 61. Okay? In Luke, if, if you are looking for notes, Luke 4, 17 to 19. This is what Jesus said. This is what the anointing is for. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me for the purposes of, of my Father. Jesus was to do the purposes of his Father. Hallelujah. And the same, I want to tell you this morning, that the same anointing for preaching as it is for breaking bondages and healing, all this, it is the same anointing for blessing and favor. It's this anointing that Jesus received, the same anointing that is residing in you and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you that it is the anointing that makes the difference in your life and my life. Hallelujah. Hmm? So believers are anointed, empowered, and equipped 
Okay? It's just that God wants you to take you to the next level of his anointing. Don't remain ankle deep. Don't remain waist deep. Don't remain knee deep. Huh? Have, get the full measure of the Holy Spirit so that you can do the works that God has called you to do. His purposes must be fulfilled in your life. You are not going anywhere until the purpose in your life is fulfilled. You have, a, everyone has a purpose. You are not going to go anywhere. Oh, I got cancer, I got this, I'm going to go already. Huh? Until the purpose in your life is fulfilled, you are not going anywhere. And no devil can take away that purpose in your life. God, God, God's purpose in your life, God will fulfill it. But you must be the instrument that opens up and says, I want to have a full measure of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what we need to know. Can I have the next slide, please? How do you walk? Yeah. What? Okay. How do you activate? You need to tell me I got the anointing, but how to activate? Huh? Okay. We come back to the same parable. Now I'm going to finish with this. How do we activate that anointing? It is inside us. Okay, it's inside us. Now we want full measure. Okay, you, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get the full measure of the Holy Spirit. Good. Now, how do I go around? How do I activate it? How do I get the fullness of the anointing? That's very important. See the notes there. Number one. Huh? It's the same thing that we need to know. Don't think that God has not called you. Everyone has a purpose in this church. There are people in here who are anointed to start orphanages and homes. Hallelujah. There are people in here who are anointed to teach kids. There are people in here anointed to raise kids, to raise children. The Holy Spirit wants to guide and empower and anoint husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, siblings and children. He wants to anoint businessmen. So the anointing is there. How do you activate it? You see, the thing is that we have the anointing, but we do not know how to activate it. So, so let's go to, uh, yeah, okay. If you are having a Bible, you can turn to Matthew 25 and keep it there. Because I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to tell you, Matthew 25 is talking about, Jesus is talking about have, us having that extra oil in our lamps in order for us to be in the marriage feast, okay? So here, the first thing that we need to activate our anointing is you need preparation. You need preparation. Where is it? Ah, uh, number one, you need preparation. Here, the parable of the uh, ten virgins. Please stay with me. I'm going to finish after this. <clears throat> Here, you all know the parable, I think. Jesus was talking about the ten virgins. Five of them wise, five of them foolish. This is a parable. It's a story. But he's telling this is exactly what is going to happen. What you need to do in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. He is comparing. Okay. So he's here. He's saying that they were, what was Jesus? What was Jesus uh, emphasizing? He was emphasizing on the oil that the five foolish virgins took and the five wise virgins took. He's emphasizing on the oil. What does oil signify? Oil signifies the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In order to live in this life. Hallelujah. You need preparation. See, all ten of the virgins, they were pure. Okay, all ten of them were pure. And they were all prepared. Not, not all were prepared. Five were prepared, five were not prepared. Five were prepared. And what is the job of this? Um, and I must go back again. What is the job of these ten virgins? They, they, are, they are bridesmaids. They are supposed to actually, when the bridegroom comes, they are supposed to take the bridegroom to the bride's house. That is their job with the lamps because it is dark during Jesus' time, no electricity. So they have lamps. So these 10 people had lamps, and their job, this bridesmaid's job, is to, when the, uh, when the bridegroom says that he's coming, they're supposed to take the bridegroom to the bride's house. That is their job for the marriage feast. What does he talk to you about? He's talking to you about of believers waiting for the bridegroom. Who's our bridegroom? Jesus. This morning I spoke to the discipleship class. Jesus is our bridegroom. He's coming for his church, the rapture. So Jesus is saying, don't be, un, you know, don't be caught up, uh, don't be, um, you know, unaware of what I'm speaking to you here. The five foolish virgins didn't take extra oil. They just took their lamps. The difference is that five of them was prepared, five of them not prepared. Okay, the spiritual meaning here is that you must know here. There's the, you know, you, uh, you see the first, the first, the thing here is, the five 
wise virgins, their extra oil means they depended on a life, a spirit-filled life. They depended on the Holy Spirit. And the five foolish ones who didn't have extra oil, they depended on their testimonies. What happened last time, uh, how I healed the people. Uh, they, were, they were not fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's talking about us. Okay, just get it, get it, uh, get, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Okay? Now here you must understand that also this five, see, all ten of them had good testimonies. Not they won't be chosen, okay? They had good, they had outside people all thought, thought they're very good. Okay? But the five ones with extra oil, they lived a spirit-filled life, saying, showing us that they had a hidden, their hidden life was pleasing to God. A hidden life, that means a life that nobody sees what they're doing what they're doing in their house or what they're doing in the workplace, nobody knows. People outside don't know. So their hidden life is pleasing to God. You see? So that is called a spirit-filled life. Okay. But whereas the five foolish ones, their life was only outside. It showed that they were good, uh, they were good believers. But their hidden life was in shambles. Yeah. Their life in the home was in shambles. Okay? So here what God is speaking to us is a spirit-filled life. We need to be like the five uh, wise virgins who lived a spirit-filled life, dying to the flesh, daily dying to the flesh. That is a spirit-filled life. Daily saying no, 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 hallelujah to the flesh. Okay? Next one. Let's look at the next one. Next thing what we need to do. See, there are many, uh, you see, these people started off well. These five foolish virgins, they started off well, but they didn't have enough oil, okay? They, 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 they didn't have, they didn't finish the race. They started the race, but they didn't finish the race. You see, it is very sad. They started the work, but they didn't finish the work. God is speaking to us. You started off well as a Christian, and in the race, you started off, but halfway, uh, too, 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 too many problems, uh, uh, I don't want to go to church, I don't want to pray, I don't want to worship. You know, things like that. So, you, you fall off from the race. So, these are half-hearted Christians God is speaking about. I don't want to be in that category. I want to hear God, Jesus saying, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Come into the marriage feast. I want to hear that. So, the first thing is preparation. The second thing is, let's quickly go. The second thing is what you need to do is to have a fresh supply need to have a fresh supply of the of the oil okay talking about the, the, the uh, talking about the parable again here the foolish ones had no oil they didn't take extra oil the wise ones took extra oil okay and then the bridegroom were, they were all together only the bridegroom was delayed in coming so what happened they all waited 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 and they slept off okay Talking about the bridegroom again, talking about Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he went there. He went up to heaven. And we are still waiting for his coming. And the church can get sleepy. Where is his coming? Huh? He's taking so long to come. And I told them this morning that why is he taking, why is Jesus staring? Why is Jesus not coming yet? Even though we can see the signs of his coming very soon, why is he not coming yet? Because his heart is compassionate. He doesn't want anyone to perish in the, in the lake of fire. Okay? He doesn't want anyone to perish. That's why he's waiting, giving people a chance to repent and come to him. Okay? So here, you must understand, we must not be sleeping. Okay? We need fresh anointing, fresh oil of the Holy Spirit every day of our lives. A uh, fresh touch. You cannot depend on yesterday's anointing. I, uh, the, a few weeks ago, uh, I, I, I was very anointed, you know, I, 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 I preach and I teach and everything, very anointed. But today, huh? So you need a fresh anointing. Hallelujah. Okay? You need the freshness of the oil that freshens up the touch of God in your life. Hallelujah. Huh? So here, we need a... Why, why, why can't we have a fresh oil? Why need, do we need a fresh oil? Because fresh oil and the fresh touch of God gives a, a, a level of anointing, greater level of anointing. If your oil, if, the, if, the, if your heart, if the vessel is full of sin, God cannot pour his anointing on you. So every time you must come before him, come with a heart of repentance, come with a spirit of repentance before him and ask him to fill you up again, 
repent first and ask him to fill you up again. That is a fresh touch. Okay? We do not want the anointing to be contaminated. Hallelujah. So anointing represents the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is like a dove. It's a dove means a very, um, a very gentle bird. You know, if there's sin, it will just flutter away. It won't function. Huh? So here, in, in the book of Ecclesiastes 10 and 1, it says that in, the, let me tell you something. The oil, okay, you take oil first. In the oil, in that oil that they are, in the Old Testament that they were, that they pour to, to, to set apart people for the service of God, that oil, if it's, if it is, is stale, if it's not fresh, if you one or two days you keep that oil, what happens is it is the flies are attracted to this oil. Flies are attracted and they fall inside, they become dead flies. And what happens is this oil, it becomes stings. There's no more aroma, freshness of God's, God's Spirit. You know? Speaking to us that our anointing can become contaminated by dead flies. Dead flies means things in our life. Sin, things in our life. That's dead flies. Okay, get it very clear. Why is my anointing not working? Why is my anointing not functioning? You must understand. Search your heart and see if there's any dead flies. If there's any sin, if there's any dead flies in your oil of the Holy Spirit. Okay, here, just one fly in your anointing. The anointing is there. Just one fly, that means one uh, sin in your anointing can spoil the whole anointing. I just spoke to you just now, okay? So let me tell you this, and I want to tell you that little things can kill the anointing. God has placed his anointing in you, but there are things that can kill that anointing. Like how Samson's anointing, how did God kill it? Because of sexual immorality. Okay, let me tell you some of the dead flies. Some of the dead flies that can uh, cause that, that can contaminate your anointing. You have that anointing. All of us have that anointing. But certain things can contaminate it. And that's number one critical spirit. A critical spirit in your, in your life can cause the anointing to be killed. Critical, criticize about this, criticize about church people, criticize about family, criticize about this person, that person. A critical spirit is can kill the anointing in your life and my life. Okay, we need to be careful about the things that we say. Always say positive things about your church. Say positive things about your family. Say positive things about, uh, you know, uh, about your pastors and leaders. Say positive so that your anointing will be fresh all the time. It is not contaminated with sin. It is not contaminated with the critical spirit. And number one is critical spirit. Because criticism can be a dead fly in the anointing. Listen very carefully. A critical spirit can be. A, well, you will think, why is my anointing not working? Why when I come and do it, it's not working? It's not functioning. Check yourself. See if there's any dead fly in that anointing. Okay? Marital problems. Uh, when we have marital problems, we have family. I'm not talking about every day, we are bickering. I'm not talking about that. When the marital problem gets extreme, there's extreme arguing, there's extreme bitterness, there's extreme anger against one another. You know what it says? That your anointing will not function. It is in Malachi, if you are, if you are a married person, write down this. Malachi 2 and 15 says, Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. That means don't mistreat your wife or mistreat your husband because it will not work. Your anointing will not work. It will not function. It's there. You will remain there like that. Huh? So don't disrespect your spouse. What else is a dead fly in your anointing? Unforgiveness. For years you didn't forgive this auntie. And you're thinking, why, why can I go? Why can I go to the next level of anointing? Why I cannot? Check yourself. Unforgiveness is a dead fly in the anointing. What about depression? What about murmuring and complaining? All these are dead flies in your anointing. So what, what God is speaking to us? Remove all the hindrances. Come empty of your sin. Of all that hindrances, come empty. And get a fresh touch, fresh anointing from God. So that it will destroy the yoke. Destroy the yoke in your life. Hallelujah. All ten of them got their lambs ready. And then uh, the foolish ones saw in their lamb, oh, no more oil. So they went to the, uh, to the wise ones. Give us some of your oil. 
give us some of your oil. What did the, what did, Jesus is telling this parable. What did the uh, wise one say? No, we cannot give you this oil is just enough for us. We cannot give you any of the oil. You go and buy from the shop yourself. We cannot give you. So what he is speaking about is that when Jesus comes back, you see, you cannot suddenly say that, you know, um, you, you have to get your own supply of oil. You are not anointed just because, you, don't think uh, you are anointed just because your parents are anointed. You are not anointed just because you come to the church that's anointed. You must receive Jesus as your personal savior. You must activate the anointing yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You cannot depend on somebody else's anointing. You are anointed because the Holy Spirit lives in you. That is why. It's not because of someone else's anointing. You cannot get a supply of anointing from somebody else. Hallelujah. Okay? This is something you must understand. You cannot rely on the anointing of another to accomplish what God has given you to accomplish. God has given you the anointing to accomplish this. You cannot expect the anointing from somebody else to come and pray for you and all that and get the anointing. You cannot. You must get your own supply of anointing. That's why you see people, they think they bring one big, uh, they bring a very anointed person to come and preach. That, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you can get his anointing. Yes, he can impart for you, he can pray with you, he can leave and then he can go. But you've got to get your own supply of anointing. You get to get your own supply of the Holy Spirit for yourself because you have been given the anointing. You have been given the Holy Spirit. You cannot depend on on. On other people. So I've heard of people have uh, conference after conference, meeting after meeting, and they get boost from God. Oh, oh, this preacher is so fantastic. Oh, you see the healing and all that. After that, all fizzle already. Huh? All fizzles off. You know? Yes, it is good to go for all these meetings, but you cannot expect their anointing to come on you. <laughs> they pay the price for it. Huh? So you have to cultivate your own anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the last one, and this I close. You need to pay the price. You need to pay the price. The last one. Yeah, you need to go verses 8. Here on the verses is talking about in the parable of the, when you go back, the pa Matthew 25, and all the verses are from the parable of the 10 virgins. So I'm not, uh, because I, to save time, I'm just giving it to you because you already know when the last preached here. Okay, the next one is you pay the price. Okay? You need to pay the price. That's why you see somebody, someone's anointing is so great. Why? Because he paid the price. Like I just told you, in worship, in the word, in praying all the time. He was not sitting and looking and watching TV the uh, whole time. You know, and then expect the anointing to come on him on Sunday morning. No. You've got to pay the price for it. You've got to lock yourself in the room, pray. Consistent prayer. Hmm? That is the keys. I put uh, the next one, please. Ah. Uh, that is the keys to releasing your anointing. That means you pay the price. You have to pay your own price for the anointing. Huh? You have to lay down your life for God to use you. How? You know, this is the way you pay the price. You must have faith in God. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith. So when you have the anointing, you must have faith that God can use you to touch other people's lives. You must have faith. Second thing is, you must have a consistent prayer life. You have to pay the price for your anointing. Huh? That's why you see the level of anointing, different people, different. Okay? And in fasting and in the word, how much you spend your time on these things is the level of anointing that seeps into your, in, in, into your heart. Okay? Our prayer life must be effect, effective and fervent. Okay? We must uh, uh, pray, especially in the spirit. I told you, that's the only language the devil doesn't know. When you pray in the spirit, he doesn't know. Only you and God can understand that language. So you're safe. The devil can't hear whatever you're saying. Just pray in the tongues. As much as possible, pray in the spirit. Hallelujah. Because the anointing is tangible. You can feel it. Hmm? And the presence of God that comes on a person changes the person with the tangible anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So your prayer life must be consistent, like how Jesus, you know, what, what, whenever Jesus was not doing anything, he was always somewhere in the mountaintop uh, praying to his father. His prayer life was consistent, great prayer life, effective prayer life Jesus had. Even though he was God, he was, but he had a fantastic, consistent prayer life. Okay? And you can see when he came out and, 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 and the anointing after he fasted, and not only did Jesus pray, Jesus also fasted 40 days in the wilderness. 
what happened after that 40 days when the devil came to attack him with all kinds of temptations, Jesus was able to defeat the devil. How? Why? Because he paid a price for the, and he fasted for 40 days. The anointing broke, not broke, defeated, destroyed the enemy. Amen. Hallelujah. And then the last one is the word of God. You, know, you must know the word of God. You must know his word. Doesn't mean that, you know, you just fill up your verses. No. You know the word and you understand the word. This word, when you bring it to other people, their bondage, their yoke will be broken. When you're praying with somebody, their yoke will be broken because of the anointed word that is inside you. Hallelujah. And then the next one is worship. You saw the worship this morning. That was anointed worship. Yeah, in the spirit, he came prepared in the spirit. The team came prepared in the spirit. That is the worship. And that's what I was telling you. When, you, when the worship is anointed, what happens is it prepares the atmosphere for the word to come out. Hallelujah. That is why worship is so important. Okay. Also, all these things are important for us to activate the anointing. Please don't forget faith, prayer, fasting, the word. This is how you pay the price. You have to pay a price for the anointing in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The last slide five, the results. This is the result. You want to know the result of the anointing? What is happening? What, what, I, I, if they are so anointed, okay, let me give you a few of them. David, uh, he was anointed in the Old Testament, he was anointed with oil. What happened to him? He defeated the giant Goliath. Not only the giant, the bear and the lion with his own hands. Where did he get the strength? Anointing. He was anointed after the anointing. He could kill a bear and he could kill a lion with his bare hands. That is the anointing. Hallelujah. David. Then Paul. Yeah? Paul could. I don't have to tell about Paul. Everything you read about him is he's anointed. Okay. He cast out devils. He knows when somebody's following him, he knows there's a devil. The girl uh, who was, uh, who was um, giving all this horoscope and all these things to tell to people, he knew at once that she had a devil. She, he could discern. He had the spirit of discernment. Paul. Uh, he knew it at once. That's anointing. Peter, he just, he's a fisherman. Peter is what? Fisherman only. He only knows how to fish. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him on that day, on the Pentecost day, what happened? He preached a sermon. 3,000 souls were saved in the first meeting. He's just a fisherman. The anointing, anointing destroys the yoke. Hallelujah. It destroys the yoke. You and I also can be like that, okay? What about Jesus? Jesus also was anointed. What did he do? As soon as he was anointed, he went, the Bible says he went and did good works. Heal the sick, clean and cleanse the lepers and all these things, okay? So all these people here, more people, more. The Bible is full of those people who have been anointed. So in, in, in closing, I want to tell you, the anointing makes the difference. Next one. Six. The anointing makes the Everybody shout, the anointing. Yes. Hallelujah. Give God. Hallelujah. You see, you see, the Holy Spirit, the symbol of the Holy Spirit is the dove. The dove is very gentle. Amen. Very gentle. You just throw something down, it will fly, fly off. So, where the sin is concerned, he will not function. Okay? I'll finish with that now. I will conclude with this. So I want to conclude early because it's already 11.57, I didn't know we went so far. We have programs. I don't want to hurry the Holy Spirit. I never like to hurry any service because the Holy Spirit can move as He likes and as He wills. So we will give Him enough time next week because today we have programs, I think anniversary and cutting the cake and all these things. So I don't want to rush with the Holy Spirit. I want next week, Pastor Bernard and myself will be, uh, uh, will be having a fresh anointing service, fresh fire anointing service next week. So next week we'll be praying for people who want to go from one level to the other level to the other level and for people who want the bondages to be broken. Hallelujah. Not broken, destroyed. Our bondages, the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. So next week, don't miss the service. It will be a fresh fire anointing service. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me have the worship team. We must just close with the praising God. Can I have the worship team? We'll sing this song just once and then we'll pray and then I'll hand over to Pastor Bernard. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful Savior. Wonderful Master. Just wherever you are, 
just close your eyes and be in an attitude of worship. God, His Holy Spirit has spoken to us. He doesn't want us to remain as a spectator level or ankle level or um, waist, um, knee level or waist level. He wants us to be fully immersed in His Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He wants to take you and I to the next level. God spoke very clearly. He wants to take you to the next level of His anointing. Hallelujah. Full anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, hallelujah.